This is a new Nigeria with Wale Oluwade. This is your current affairs program where we're critically examining the strategic issues bedeviling Nigeria's developmental aspirations and boldly offer practical, bold, but radical ideas on building the Nigeria of our collective uh, desires. On today's uh, edition of the program, um, we'll round up on the series I began um, some weeks back on transformational uh, leadership. We would examine briefly where we missed it in Nigeria because we did have a transformational leader in Nigeria at some point, but we missed that opportunity and why it is incumbent on us to have that kind of leadership at this point in our history if we're, about, if we're ever going to make any meaningful uh, progress going forward. We'll take this short break and when I return, we'll get right into the presentation. Please stay with us. Welcome back. And now let's get right into the presentation. So, like I said, this is the concluding part, part three, of the strategic imperatives for transformational leadership. Before we go forward, let, let's, let's examine types of leadership. There are negative types of, of leaders. You have bad leaders who are corrupt, nepotistic, hedonistic. That, that means they like enjoyment, you know. And then you have weak leaders, indecisive, complacent, indolent, etc. Then you have dangerous leaders who are divisive, they spread hatred, they seek to subjugate and exterminate, and the history of the world is replete with such leaders. Then you have positive types of leaders, good leaders, they are very competent, very good leaders, competent and effective. You have great leaders, competent, effective, and achieves you know, some degree of results. But then the highest form of positive leaders are transformational leaders, and that's what we'll be looking at in, in, in the past uh, few weeks. Before going further, I want us to compare um, some interesting historical uh, uh, facts, you know, um, of the United States of America and also use that to, to compare with Nigeria at, the, at some point in our history. There are some men that are called the founding fathers of America. Out of them, these five, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, you know, they took turns one after the other, you know, to become uh, American presidents. And then the sixth, John Quincy Adams was the son of the second president, you know, John Adams. Now, the number seventh, um, Alexander Hamilton, was the first U.S. Tre uh, Treasury, U.S. Secretary of Treasury, meaning in, our, uh, in Nigeria we call that finance minister. And um, number 12, John Jay, was the first Chief Justice of America. Now, why is this bit of history important? Transformational leaders bring certain uh, values to governance. The reason why American institution, you know, is so strong, so enduring, is because of what this man did. Take the first uh, president, George Washington, for instance. He did eight years, two four-year terms, and afterward, they asked him to continue. He said, no, two terms of four years each is enough, and stepped down. Be besides that, in the, in the first term, they, they asked him, how would you like to be addressed? Uh, the king or your excellency, he said, no, just address me as Mr. President. Now, he brought some of these, you know, innovation, tradition, conventions into governance. Now, the, all, all of these guys, if, if, I, if I go into details, I will show you how they brought their personal values of discipline, of integrity, of, 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 of moral authority to bear on institutions in America. And that's how this country of America has endured till today that no matter whoever comes after these guys, you know, the nation they've built, you know, the, the, the institutions, you know, cannot be undone by what they've done. Now, let's go to Nigeria. Essentially, these three liberation fathers were not able to manage their differences. Imagine if when Sa Amadou Bello died, when he was assassinated, he was barely 56, and he's just one year older than Obafemi Olo, who was 55. Nam Jazikwe was five years older than, than him. So imagine if these three men had taken turns, you know, to, to govern Nigeria as president. They were not able to manage the differences. And it was that inability to manage the differences that led to, you know, the crisis that engulfed uh, the Southwest, that led to the, uh, um, um, the, the first military coup and, you know, everything snowballed out of control, the civil war. And, you know, if, if, if you take it one step after the other, that is where, that is the reason why we're where we're, we're you know, today. I just thought to bring this bit of history. But there's another reason why I brought this. Chief Obafemi Awolo 
Nigeria's missed opportunity of an unrivaled transformational leadership. Awolo was a man of very big ideas, strategic vision, exemplary integrity, personal discipline, and a strategic thinker. You remember I said one of the key attributes of transformational leaders, you know, the secret code is they have strategic visioning and strategic thinking skills. You don't have to take my word for it. We'll take uh, a short break and I'll let you see um, a couple of videos from two eminent Nigerians. One of them is late now, Professor um, professors um, Adeton Ogunshe, Nigeria's first female professor ever, and then she's the, also the first female, uh, the first professor of library science, you know, Cambridge educated. You would, you would hear her testimonial on Obafemi Olowo, and then the second is Professor um, Aki Mabo Ogunje, the first African professor of geography, is called the African father of geography, you know, you would also hear his opinion on uh, Chief Obafemi Awolo. And then the third person who would also give his opinion on um, Chief Obafemi Awolo, you know, is someone you would never expect to hear such a testimonial. Yo, so take a listen. People like me, I, I'm a one Nigeria person, but recently I've become, they, they have made me become more aware that, ah, because they have stifled the development of the South. Do you think Awolo would have been president in Nigeria? He should have. If he had been, we would have been very lucky. Really? Yes. They're not just all over the place without some rationality. There is a rationality to the way rural market are uh, developed. Mm. So what we then did was to say, let's organize the rural area into what was called an optimum community which he then says, it's an optimum strategy. And so it was from Awolowo that the concept of optimum as a strategy of development came up. And that was foresight, right? It was. You know, and, and many people still don't appreciate the fact that the rural area, in fact, to be able to service the urban area, because that's really what they do. If you go into industrialize, your raw material must come from somewhere. Okay, if you don't pay attention to where that raw material will come from, after some time, you will have problems. If you don't put roads there, if you don't put improved uh, facilities for the people to get to them. So that's the problem we are witnessing today. That is true too, yes, that we have neglected the basic infrastructure. Is it not painful that in 1978, yeah. a leader thought it wise to come out with a policy that would develop the rural area more than 40 years after? And we're still not there. Is it not painful, sir? It is. Well, uh, you starting to talk about what makes a leader. Because that's really what Nigeria hasn't had a real leader who can see the totality of our problems, not just from the minuscule of our own area, but from the totality of the area he's meant to lead. And leadership is still the real thing that is very, <laughs> it hasn't been real developed in Nigeria. Welcome back. These other two gave their testimony. Perhaps you may argue that because they are Yorubas, kinsmen of Awolowo, and probably because they also benefited immensely from his policy, some of his policies, specifically uh, free education and the scholarships he gave them to study, you know, abroad and all of that. So maybe they are biased. Now let's listen. Let's let, let's read the testimonial of someone you would never expect to give such a testimonial. Now, when Awolowo died in '87, this was a tribute by uh, retired Colonel Emeka Odumegu Ojuku on Chief Awolowo. He had gone to visit and had written that Awolowo was the best president Nigeria ever had. Now, in 2011, 
he had a reason to expatiate on why he made that statement. And this was what he said. I will not read everything, but just suffice to say, he said, in political terms, it would be considered an adversary of the Igbo, given the intense rivalry between him and Dr. Namdi Azikiwe. As a leader of the modern caste, he has left Nigeria standards which are indelible, standards beside which future aspirations to public leadership can be eternally measured. He was, for, for a long time, the only Nigerian leader that enunciated principles and played down personalities. He was a brilliant political administrator and a most erudite teacher. He continued, Nigeria must continually regret that he never, for many reasons, had the opportunity to serve at the presidential level. Hawo was a leader of great stature. He was a leader who was eminently successful that, that he did not fulfill a presidential ambition cannot detract from his leadership. And us, poor us, who were not his people, must continue to regret that our own leaders had not led us as he did his people or achieved for us as he did for his people. You can read the entirety of what Ojume, uh, Ojumegu Ojuku said about Obafemi Awolowo. And um, what a great man uh, uh, Chief Odumegu Ojuku is, or was, because he's, he's since passed away. You know, they, 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 if you understand what the role our law played in, after the Civil War, you know, and how he ensured the federal government won against the Igbo people, you know, uh, Ojuku, if he was a, a, less, a lesser man with a, with a smaller mind, would not write this kind of tribute, you know, uh, flow, glowing tribute about who or what our law represented and why Nigeria would continue conti forever rule, you know, the fact that this man was unable, uh, that our law did not fulfill his ambition to preside over the uh, affairs of Nigeria. But beyond these three eminent personalities, beyond their testimonies, what exactly were the facts? What made our law to stand out? Let's go further. When our law came back from studying law in the UK, he founded the Action uh, Group Party, and these were you know, the, 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 the cardinal objectives of that party. He said, the immediate termination of British rule in every phase of our political life, the immediate termination of British rule in every phase of our political life, number one, the education of all children of school-going age. That's the, the second was the education of all children of school-going age. Number three, the general enlightenment of all illiterate children of school-going age. And then fourth, the provision of health and general welfare for all our people, the total abolition of want, that is poverty, in our society by any means, by, by means of any economic policy which is both expedient and effective. And then what was the motto of the Action Group Party? Freedom for all, life more abundantly. I will ask so much, you know, he had a strategic vision that for a nation to grow, you need you know, capable human resources. Beyond that, because of his own personal struggles to attain uh, uh, um, education, which was quite challenging, you know, he struggled when his father died, he struggled, did many jobs, you know, moved from one school to the other to attain education. So he realized education was key to liberating mankind from the shackles and bondage of poverty. Now, beyond rhetorics, beyond rhetorics, what were the um, 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 uh, clear, the evidence of performance while in office. So in due course, Aolo awarded over 200 post-secondary scholarships annually, which rose to 1,200 yearly by 1959. As of that era, Aolo was awarding annually 1,200 scholarships, you know, to Nigerian students of Southwestern region to go study abroad. By the time he vacated office as a premier in 1959, more than one million pupils were in primary schools as against 429, 542, you know, thousand in 1953. So he took primary school enrollment from barely 430,000 to 1 million. The number of secondary schools also rose to 139 as against 25. When Aolawa came into office as premier in 1954, the entire primary, secondary schools in southwest Nigeria were 25, but he increased it to 139. Then what happened as a result of that? Now, there were 9,000 pupils in secondary schools in 1954. 9,000 pupils in secondary school in 1954. Now, this population rose to 84,000, 10,000% increase. Aolawa increased um, 
secondary school enrollment by over 10,000% from 9,000 in 1954 to 84,000 in January 1959, by far larger than the combined population of all secondary school enrollments in other parts of Nigeria. The, the secondary school enrollment in the, in the southwest region of Nigeria between 1954 and 1959 was far higher than the entire, you know, uh, co co the combined uh, number of enrollments in the other parts of Nigeria because of strategic vision of our law. In addition, 363, you know, 363 secondary modern schools, trade centers, and teacher training colleges with the teacher training colleges having 11,000 trainees by 1953. Our law not just ensured school enrollment, he ensured, you know, teacher training colleges were built with 11,000 trainees in, you know, in school as of 1953. As a result of strategic vision, many educated people of the Western region of, of the time were lifted from penury, that's poverty, and obscurity through the educational policies of Obafemi Aulawo. We live in times now where we have to practically open the brains or the heads of our leaders to let them understand the, the, the power, the, 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 the inability of any nation to progress without education. But there was a man in the history of this country. You know, in Nigeria, we have 20 million plus out of school children on the streets. We have states in Nigeria, Zamfara, for instance, where when it's time to write Wahek, they don't present candidates to write Wahek. Most parts of the north of Nigeria, that's what is going on. This man, Awolo, he lived, you know, ahead of the curve of, of leadership. Not just in Nigeria, in Africa, and you'll see shortly. What other notable achievements did our law record beyond education? As premier between 1954 and 59. So I just mentioned some in educational feats. Now, our law built the first television station in the entire of Africa, at least West Africa, if not the entire, entirety of Africa. And not until 1975, before the rest of Nigeria had television station, when the NCA was founded and, the, and the, the assets of Western Nigerian television station were acquired by the Nigerian Television Authority. Vision, strategic vision. Our law built the first skyscraper in Africa, the Cocoa House, in 1965. It was commissioned in 1965, directly from the proceeds of agricultural produce. The first skyscraper in, you know, Africa. The first um, modern stadium in Africa was built in 1960. And this stadium hosted um, the, the boxing match, you know, international bo boxing match, you know, in 1962 or 63. Now, and all of this he did by setting up commodity boards that bought, that bought farm produce, cocoa, you know, and rubber and all of that, you know, from farmers, you know, they trained extension workers, and they bought all of this, government bought all of this and exported. And Aulo achieved all of this, you know, by by, by, by strategic thinking, you know, prudent resources, uh, management of resources. Our law did not do all of what he did in education, all of that, by borrowing. He didn't do that by living a prof profligate lifestyle. It was not, um, you know, I mean, you need to study the history and, 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 and understand how this man, you know, avoided wastage in government. That was the man, our law. So this, this was a man that Nigeria missed his services uh, greatly. Why is transformational leadership a strategic differentiator, and why have I focused on it in these past episodes? Why did I bring up the story of Awolowo? Is it just to romanticize and to rule our loss? No. The reason is because there is something transformational leaders bring to governance that every other leader don't, don't have, or they do not have in sufficient quantity. So you may have a good leader or a great leader, you know, but transformational leaders bring something to the table that is quite different. And what are these? Personal integrity, moral authority, and personal discipline. And I'll allow you to watch the next few, uh, these short video clips of another transformational leader, uh, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, the Singapore founding uh, prime minister who I, tell, I, I dwelt on extensively in the second um, episode of this. I want you to see these short videos and then I'll come back for my closing statements. Please take a, a, a listen. Nordin remembers well the areas he and Lee visited. 
Most were to new housing and infrastructure projects that were still in development. The Prime Minister would usually go for a night walk with Mrs Lee, and they usually go to Istana. But at times, he also wanted to walk outside of Istana. The first time he walked outside was to go to Old Airport Road HDB Estate in Kalang. When we arrived here, we were stopped over there. So we were walking around the HDB blocks over there. So after 20, 30 minutes walk, he asked whether he could see the H SIT flag, the older SIT flag. So I decided to take him across the road and came over here. Well, for me, everything changed. It looks strange because all the buildings are new. Uh, I can't remember all the places that I visited before, but definitely is the location where we stopped. Nordin's fellow bodyguard, Karupaya Kandasamy, also has fond memories following Lee around. Kanda is 83. I did realize that he was such a disciplined man. And after his duty every day without fail, whether rain, shine, or thunder, he still wants to do his normal exercise. He was such a disciplined man. I salute him. On top of his exercise, Mr. Lee is very particular with his food. When Lee Kuan Yew decided on a life in politics years ago, he was renowned in political circles for being clean. As the newly elected Prime Minister in 1959, he made it mandatory for his entire cabinet to be dressed uniformly in white shirts and trousers. The idea was to symbolize austerity and integrity. Despite his personal wealth, Li and his family always lived modestly. There were few signs of a wealthy lifestyle. And his life was free from any kind of scandal, too. Lee would never spend an unnecessary dollar of public funds on himself. He always flew on scheduled flights, never chartered, and stayed in regular hotel rooms. Welcome back, and here are my closing statements. Why have I spent the last three episodes on the topic of transformational leadership? I mentioned earlier there are, uh, are great leaders, there, there are good leaders, great leaders, and transformational leaders, types of, of leadership categories. However, the desirability for transformational leadership 
at this moment in Nigeria's history rest largely on three of the 12 principles or secret codes of great leadership. Great leadership. Number one, strategic visioning, strategic thinking, and more than this, personal values, discipline, morality, and mindset. Why, why are these strategic, why are these of strategic importance? You see, the world is governed by certain spiritual laws or principles, regardless of your color, language, race, or ethnicity, and the faith you profess or do not profess. These apply to everyone. Also, these universal principles or laws are equally immutable and non-discriminatory. Cause and effect is a universal law that's immutable and non-discriminatory. Likewise, sowing and reaping, that's another law. Also, you have another law, which is every living thing reproduces after its kind. Therefore, apple tree can only produce apples, and so on. In my study and teaching of leadership, the body of evidence has proven quite incontrovertibly that leaders reproduce after themselves. Thus, a corrupt leader will reproduce corrupt citizens, and a devious, dubious, and divisive leader will likewise reproduce as, 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 as himself or herself. In Nigeria, especially since the late 1970s, it has been a combination of this plus a huge measure of egregious incompetence. The many acts of moral and financial corruptions, value degradation, and institutional collapse across our nation's socioeconomic and political landscape is a clear reflection and approximation of the character and values of most of our leaders at every level of the leadership spectrum. For as long as this subsists, subsist, quantum progress, development, and prosperity will continue to elude us as a nation. Remember, change requires action, and positive change requires positive action. I believe in a new Nigeria, and it is possible. And that's the program uh, today. Please, if you believe this platform is relevant, I urge you to tell your family and friends about it. Then, do kindly sub subscribe to my YouTube channel so you can watch this video and the others that are there. Also, share the videos and drop me your comments. I'd love to hear from you, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.